Anastasia Naplakova won the Rudolf Ferkushny International Competition in Prague. Uh, she recently got her degree in pedagogy from the University of Miami, studying with Santiago Rodriguez. She comes to New Mexico to play the Mozart Concerto No. 20 with the New Mexico Philharmonic this Saturday. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. First, let's talk about, uh, since you have a degree in pedagogy, how important is it to a student to have a teacher? Oh, <laughs> uh, it is the most important thing, in my view, to development of any student uh, in early life, but also for adults, even for performing professional performing artists. Uh, teacher, perhaps, maybe is not the word, but the mentor, I would say, is more inappropriate. Uh, to me, of course, without my mentors, uh, I, I cannot imagine where I would be today. Is it important to have as a mentor someone who is also a performer? Absolutely. Um, so it's hard to describe how uh, one should perform and what one should think and how one should um, prepare for the performance if you haven't done so yourself. And in my case, Santiago Rodriguez uh, is a well-known international performer with a very big career and has played, I believe in his repertoire, more than 50 concertos alone. I'm not even speaking of his repertoire as a solo performer. Uh, so immediately when I brought up that I'm playing two Mozart concertos this uh, season, he immediately said, oh, those two are the most the hardest ones, prepare well. <laughs> and I believe if he didn't have the uh, knowledge of it in, in first person, that that might have not been the phrase he would set first. When you're studying with, with someone like that, uh, more than just the technical demands, is there some emphasis on uh, on communicating the emotion of the piece as well to an audience? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, again in case with my mentor, uh, his communication with the audience is absolutely astonishing. He grabs anybody in, in the hole from the second he walks in and, and, and holds it. <laughs> you, you can't uh, stop watching, you can't stop listening. And this is something I, I have to learn and I have to observe first person. And emotionally, when performing the piece, uh, um, of course, it, it's individual from one person to the next, from one performer, from one piece to the next. Uh, but there is this certain sense of connection, emotional connection to the piece, to the audience, to, to the whole atmosphere of that particular performance. That's, it, it's hard to describe it. It's, it. it's just something special that happens on stage. Let's talk about the Mozart Concerto Number no. 20. You said it's one of two that you have in your repertoire this season. This is a, a, a piece that, in, in many ways, I think, kept Mozart's reputation as a composer when he had gone out of fashion, because it's not so much a classical concerto. It's really almost the first romantic concerto, isn't it? I agree absolutely with that. It, well, I might exaggerate by saying it opens the door into the romantic era, but it grabs the handle and it holds it firmly, definitely. The first concerto written in the minor key for Mozart, one of the only two, and those are the two that I've been playing this season. Uh, and the influence goes way beyond it, so it's hard to grasp the entire influence of that concerto for the, the rest of the music. Well, first thinking of Beethoven and of course his cadences and he played the concerto himself. He also played the C minor concerto and uh, influence of that C minor concerto of Mozart on Beethoven who wrote his third piano concerto uh, very well connected to, to the Mozart's 24th. Uh, that is one pass and then thinking also of Brahms for example who wrote cadences for the D minor for the 20th concerto and then his own first concerto is in D minor, first piano concerto. And I mean, it, it, the influence is huge, but I think also the significance for Mozart of the key of D minor was, uh, was, was quite, uh, quite obvious. I mean, you would think of his Requiem and the Mass and parts of Don Giovanni, 
that are written in D minor and the, that whole dramatic aura that, that started basically with D minor concerto in, in my view. <laughs> and uh, those other pieces you mentioned, their vocal works, there's a lot of, of the feeling of the piano singing as a human voice in this piece, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, the, well, of course, the melodic gift of Mozart was uh, uh, unsurpassable, I think. Uh, you know, it's interesting that this concerto does not start with that uh, melody that we expect from Mozart in the beginning, that uh, elegant, singing, fluent melody that he typically uh, starts with uh, all of the, his concerti with. And this one is so different. No, the piano soloist, well, yes, of course, com comes in with the melody, but the orchestra, no. The orchestra is fighting, in, in many ways, sort of uh, wandering off of the key. It is, a, it is very much like what you would hear in later Beethoven and into the Romantic era. Yes. And the interplay between the orchestra and the piano is very atypical of Mozart. It's not call and response. Sometimes they're actually sort of fighting each other, and it's much more an orchestra uh, uh, underpinning this, the soloist. In parts, yes, I agree with that. In parts, there is an interplay, almost like a chamber music interplay, parts of the orchestra, for example, the winged part of the orchestra and the piano, for, in, in, for instance, in this third movement, uh, it, it's, it's magical interplay between a little bits of piano, little bits of orchestra, back and forth, back and forth. It's <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the second movement, uh, actually the second and third movement both begin with piano, but that second movement, just a gorgeous, gorgeous piano melody. And then Mozart can't seem to help himself. It gets very dramatic and stormy in the middle before he returns at the end to the to the sort of piece of that melody. Absolutely without warning. <laughs> that middle part of the second movement comes in without any warning and can take anybody by storm. It's so with, with all the minor and uh, why, he still returns to a major key and leaves you leaving the hall sort of uplifted. <laughs> yes, a little bit of a... Hollywood happy ending at the end, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I wonder it myself. Uh, he ends the first movement quietly. After all the storm in the, in the beginning of it, in the middle of it, and I'm playing Beethoven's cadenza, which is also quite stormy. Then the movement suddenly ends on this quiet note. Uh, but at the end of the third movement, he returns to the happy ending. I wonder, is that because the audience expected at the time? Is, is he trying to maybe a little bit conform while the rest of concerto does not conform with the standards of the time? Yeah, it's, um, I, I don't it's know if anyone's ever solved it, <laughs> yeah. no. However, the, the way it comes in after the cadenza of the third movement, that happy D major <laughs> ending, it, it, it's exuberant. Well, it, and it's also probably meant to get you a curtain call, which I'm sure it will, and probably did Mozart in his day as well. I'm sure it did Mozart in his day. Uh, even his father, I believe, said that it was one of the best mm -hmm. of Mozart's pieces. And of course, typical of Mozart, it wasn't really finished until the day before, so he hadn't even had time to run through all the pieces in the cathedral. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I believe it wasn't even finished on the day off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is probably why we lost Mozart's own scadenzas. That's right, they don't even exist. He, they don't exist, he didn't have time to write them down. And so are you playing the Beethoven cadenzas? Yes, I chose Beethoven's for this for this time. Oh, fascinating. Anastasia Naplakova plays this Saturday night with the New Mexico Philharmonic, Saturday 6 p.m. The program also con includes the overture to the abduction from the Seraglio and the Symphony No. 40, conducted by music director Roberto Minchuk. I'm Brent Stevens. I'll host a pre-concert talk at 5 o'clock. Tickets available at any UNM Tickets outlet at 925-5858 or online nmphil.org. Anastasia, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here.